Can you all hear me? How many of you have read Prosperity for Writers? Oh, sweet. How many of you are a writer and you want more prosperity? <laughs> it's not a trick question. Okay, cool. So I normally don't do handouts. I normally go by the seat of my pants when I'm speaking, unless I'm doing like a big official training session. So I want to gather some information after John finds his seat. Let's hear it for John, everyone. Woo! All right, I just want you to know when you said the troublemakers were in the front row, I took that as a challenge. Okay, I also have to kind of, um, I want to gather some information, but at first I want to do a um, full disclosure. I've had lots of coffee today. <laughs> I had a client in town, my editor and I were working with a client who's writing a book, it's her first time, and so we have had a little bit of magic beans. <laughs> Fair enough, good, all right, okay, cool. So, um, published authors, raise your hand. More than one book, more than two books, more than five books, more than 20 books, Okay, all right, awesome. And so who can tell me their top three challenges around money and are willing to say them, or even your top challenge around money? Yes, sir, what's your name? Chris Baker. Hi, Chris. Well, I still have this really crappy thing called a career that has to pay the bills, and I'd like to change that. And awesome. Money from my writing. Are you making any money from your writing? Uh, not really right now, but. Okay, like cup of coffee money, not new house money. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, cup of coffee money, yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. We all started there. Hi. I think I probably speak for a lot of people. Just getting it. Getting money. <laughs> Just getting money in general from any source? Or specifically from your writing? Or is it a little bit of both? Um, the specific, specifically writing. And writing related projects. Okay. For example, you do training. Correct. Okay. So am I safe in assuming that somewhere in your thought process or your upbringing or your raising, someone said to you that artists are starving? <laughs> that if you went to your parents and you said, Mom, Dad, I want to go and to Hollywood and write movies, they would say what? Anybody? You're crazy. Get a real job. <laughs> Get, Get a real, a real job. job, right? Have something to... Fall back, on. fall back on, right? And this is a societal thing. We're all told that people who try to make money from their art, so writers, painters, poets, are floofy. What? Musicians. Oh, musicians, right? Are the ones that put a $5,000 guitar in a $5, $500 car to drive 500 miles to make $50, right? And we all laugh. And yet don't we know writers who make money from their writing and painters who make money from their painting. Don't we? Don't we know of them if we don't know them? And so is there anything in your mind that's kind of like asterisk after their name? They're a unicorn, they're special. So it could happen for them, but I'm not sure if it can happen for me or it definitely can't happen for me. Is that resonating with anybody? Okay, so is everyone okay with a little swearing now and again? I won't do an F-bomb, but I'm just gonna say like, well, I, I might under certain circumstances, but not now, not since the camera's on. Um, but like all of that is bullshit. So I wrote originally Prosperity for Writers because I have been practicing practical prosperity for my whole adult life. And I'm not the person that sits in the lotus position because I frankly can't get into it. I'm not... <laughs> Like, I'm not bendy enough to get into the lotus position, so I'm just qualified from that. But I'm not the person that sits and goes, oh, money comes to me, money comes to me, money comes to me. Right? But I'm also not on the other side that says, oh, I had to go to law school to get a law degree, but I really want to be an artist, but I need something. This is dangerous, this microphone situation, I'm telling you right now. Um, I don't need something to fall back on. So I'm right square in the middle. So I wrote Prosperity for Writers because I went to, you all have heard of the Smarter Artist Summit, Sean, Johnny, and Dave, the um, self-publishing podcast guys. They put on the Colonist Summit, which was kind of their second little group thing. And I'm, I was like a stalker, like a safe, non-dangerous stalker that would listen. And when I heard them say, yes. Say what this is, this podcast again? The self-publishing podcast. Okay. Yes. 
They're not safe for work, but very funny and, and super fun. And I would, I found them. I thought they were my people. I need to know them. And they talked about this colonist summit that they were having. And I wrote to them and I said, can I come? I've already written books and I'm a nonfiction person, but I'd like to come. And they said, sure, you can come. And I got in that room with two dozen people and I thought, oh, I found my people. And there's one of them right there. Leslie Watts, everyone. <laughs> Best editor ever. Okay. <clears throat> So I go to this um, summit and I'm connecting with my people and I hear from some of them, they're making a living from their writing and they're doing very well, right? And then I'm talking to some people and they're saying what all you all are saying, which is I'm not making as much money from my writing, but I'm reading their writing and it's good writing. And so there's a little disconnect in our brains, right? If it's good, why isn't anybody buying it, right? So I'm thinking to myself, gosh, I, I know that it's not the writing that's not good. It's what's going on in here that's not good. You all are good people. You all are writing good words, but there's a disconnect. And so what you're believing is part of the disconnect. And then what you're doing is the other piece, right? So we're going to go a little bit low disposition and a little bit law school. And this is me like right in the middle. So I want to give you like three practices that are practical and three that are more prosperity and woo woo. I'm gonna to try to kind of bring it all in so we can all connect to it, right? Because if it's too woo-woo, you get in your car and are like, I could have stayed home, it was Sunday, it was raining, there's ice cream in the freezer. <laughs> and if I'm too practical, then you think, well, I didn't learn anything new because I already knew all that shit and I'm not doing it anyway, right? Fair enough? Okay, all right. So I wanna start out by saying, I'm gonna cover some of the stuff that's in prosperity for writers, but a lot of it I'm not going to cover. And so you'll have to fill in the gaps by either asking me, reading the book after, and I'll stay until the last question is answered. Cool? Is there anything else that I haven't said so far? Anything that I'm missing that you want to make sure that I loop in? Okay, you got nothing. All right. Yes. So you don't have to do this now, but you're going to bring in your own career as you describe this? Oh, I wasn't really going to talk about me. So why don't you ask me about me later when there's, if there's time? Okay. All right. I'm the, I'm the messenger. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so I think there are three phases of the prosperous writer. So when you're first starting, the first phase is the one that kind of sucks the most, and that's the work hard phase. So if you talk to any writer person, they're going to say, I did a whole lot of work before I started to get traction. Anybody ever been on a diet, ladies? <laughs> right? And so what do you do when you're in the first phase of a diet? You eat grilled chicken and broccoli and you exercise a whole lot, and then you go get on the scale like you're naked, you've gone to the bathroom, is that just me? And you get on the scale, oh sorry, you're on the scale, and what does the scale do? Yeah, it goes up. So you put that bitch in time out until she behaves herself next time, right? No, but there's a, there's a, a process before it gets hold, right? There's lag time, where you're working really hard, and you're working really hard and nothing is seemingly happening. But I think that in that practical process of actually doing the stuff, you are actually taking hold underneath the surface. So you're watching the top of the ocean and nothing is happening, but if you could see what was underneath, there's a whole lot happening. Does that make sense? So you're starting to get hold, but what do people do if they don't get instant gratification? They quit, they complain, so there are all the things that undermine this work that you've been doing. Have you ever heard of anyone who's quit right before they would have hit success? Everybody, right? Raise your hand if you didn't ever quit right before you gained success, myself included. All right, so that's the work hard phase. But if you stay in this work hard phase long enough and you kind of put up the words and you put up the words and you put up the words, then you get to move into the work smart phase because what happens when you do something the hard way long enough? Eventually you learn your Anybody? Come on. I've been up since four o'clock this morning. You know, you gotta give me something. You learn your lessons. Yes, you kind of get the hang of it. So you move, I, come on you guys, seriously. Okay, all right, so you work smart. So then you move into phase three, which is the fun part because you're actually seeing some of the fruits of your, your labor. And I'm gonna call that the combination of the work hard and the work smart because there isn't a one of us that's making some money from our writing that isn't tired on a Sunday at 
5, 16 p.m. because we've been up since four in the morning and working all day. So I didn't get to the point to where I was making money and then I just went and sat on a beach. Nope, not a beach. <laughs> not a pina colada. So does that make sense? It's the work hard plus the work smart <coughs> equals the full-time writer. So what you're looking to do, and this is, and I'll tell you a little bit of my story since you asked, I'll throw it in, is when I turned 40, and I know that shocks some of you that I'm past 40, like <laughs> significantly past 40. Well, I decided when I was 40 that by the time I was 45, I don't laugh, Matt, that's not really that funny. <laughs> wow, okay. Am I getting paid for this? Okay, so then you don't get to make fun of me, all right? That's all I'm like, okay. <laughs> for five figures, you can laugh at me all you want, okay. <laughs> I decided that within five years I wanted to be making a full-time income from my writing because I had at that point published my first book Tall Order in 2005 and then I published The Successful Single Mom in 2009 and I published some other titles and I started to see after five years that Amazon would put this, these little pieces of money in my account every month. And when I first signed up for KDP it was you had to earn $100 and they would send you a paid uh, a paper check, but the check would have to be $100, right? So they wouldn't pay you under $100. And so I thought, well, I'm never gonna make $100 from whatever a Kindle is, because that'll never take off. <laughs> <laughs> That's not gonna work, people like paper. So eventually I get on there and I go, surely I've made $100 in five years from my Kindle version and they deposited like $9,000 into my account when I corrected my routing. So it wasn't like a, yeah. Cause I have this, this, everyone has one of these and I have a little thing that says if you deposit any money into an account, like I get an alert. So I was sitting at a Barnes and Noble in my little alert and I was like, oh, that must be an error. <laughs> yes, there was an error. <laughs> All right. But in that time I had made the decision to be, create a full-time income as a writer when I turned 40, by the time I was 45. And in that time, I kept working my, what did you call it? What kind of day job? You didn't say fun. I remember that. But it was some kind of an unfun, tedious, tedious, boring. tedious, boring day job. Excellent. How many of you have one of those? Okay, awesome. All right, well, you're not long for that job, I hope. So <laughs> go in tomorrow and hug everybody because you'll be leaving soon, okay? All right, so in that five years, I developed my not only prosperous practices pertaining to writing, but also my practical practices pertaining to writing. So let me give you the floofy ones first, okay? And then we'll bring it in with practical. All right, so you haven't read Prosperity for Writers, so you don't know what a bolo is the way I see it. But if you ever watch Law and Order <coughs> or a crime drama and they say, we're going to put out a bolo, what is it? Be on the lookout. So the suspect went that way and he's wearing a baseball cap and a blue jacket. We're going to be on the lookout for a suspect. Well, in the world of prosperity for writers, you want a bolo for full-time writers. You want a bolo for people that are making money from their art and their writing. Because as writers, what do we tend to do when we don't think something is possible for us, we call our friends and we say what? What do you say? You say nothing? <laughs> well, you say nothing. <laughs> but I have heard that there is a rumor that maybe possibly some writers and no one here <laughs> might have talked to other writers who also weren't making any money and discussed the fact that it's really to buy David Kitchen, I have an offer to buy counter. hard to make money as a writer. And so then they say, oh yes, I know, me too, I don't make any money as a writer. And like Joe over there, he's been writing for 15 years and he's still a teacher and he's not making any money. And then it goes on and on and on, right? And so what are they doing? They're boloing, but not for what they want. So your first woo-woo prosperity practice is to bolo for people that are making money from their writing. So just out of curiosity, some of your hands stayed up for a while. How many of you are making $2,500 a month from your writing? Nice. Awesome, I can't high five because then I'm like way out of the five foot range. <laughs> high five. Okay, so raise, let's raise our hands, because me too. Raise your hand again. 
Okay, so do you see there's an example out of this really tiny crowd of writers that there's some of us that are actually making money from our writing. Is, is that helpful? Am I a unicorn? No. <laughs> now I'm a unicorn. <laughs> you're not a unicorn, but you're... I heard bald is like the best today. I read somewhere that bald men are like yeah, sexier yeah. and more awesome than that. other men. Yes. <laughs> no. So go home and shake your heads, guys, because this is it. This is the example. All right. So the first thing is bolo. And the second thing is you want to give yourself a new belief. So a long time before, I was a real writer because I didn't consider myself a real writer until book seven, which is another conversation. I worked with a gal, her okay, name is Grace Boscos. Christopher, we had your offer in the buy area. Christopher, and she was an assistant to one of my business coaching clients. And my coaching client said, I want to pay you to work with my assistant because she wants to be a writer and she's a beautiful writer. She's a food writer. Would you go and work with her as a coach? And so I took her to the um, uh, restaurant in Vegas where we were working and I made her stand up outside the booth and say, I am a writer. So how many of you are writers again? Okay. And so when someone, hi, I'm on a Ray. Hi. Nice to meet you. I'm Jackie. Hi, Jackie. What do you do? I'm a writer. Excellent. There you go. <laughs> awesome. How many of you, that's your answer when someone asks what you do? Oh, wait, I'm confused. How many of you are writers? <laughs> and how many of you answer with I'm a writer when people ask you what you do? Uh, hmm. Okay. All right. Maybe you can help me get to the bottom of that later. All right. So when some, when you meet someone and they say, what do you do? Can you lead with that? Can you start to affirm that? Because whatever you say after I am is what goes in back here. And what's this? Your subconscious mind, it's your supercomputer and it does what you tell it to do. But if every time someone asks you what you do, okay, so who doesn't say I'm a writer yet? Like as of 30 seconds ago? Okay, you look so cute. This is such a cute little outfit she has on. Hi, I'm Honoré. Hi. What would you normally say? I'm Honoré, what do you do? Who are you? Um, my name's Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi. What do you do, Lisa? Uh, I'm a with content manager. <gasps> From New Zealand? Yes. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> People with awesome accents can say whatever they want. So now you're going to say, I'm a writer and a web content designer. Does that make sense? Throw that in in practice. Anybody ever lifted weights like in the gym? Do you start with the 50 pounders? No. What? Well, but you're special. I'm talking about <laughs> normal people that are not special. I remember when I had a trainer like 25 years ago and he handed me the sevens and I was like, what am I gonna do with those? And then he handed me the threes and I was like, excellent. <laughs> Cause he wanted me to do these side lateral raise thingies and they hurt with the sevens. Now I'm like, <clears throat> yeah, but it took a long time for me to get there. You don't start with the, with the strong muscles, you start with the, the weak muscles that have to be built up. So the next time someone asks you what you do, you have to promise me you're gonna say I'm a writer. Promise? Raise your hand if you promise. Okay, we're gonna pinky swear after. This is really important. This is really important. Okay, so then you have your little thing to fill in, right? So I write, I write nonfiction for people professionals who read nonfiction. Simple. Okay. So you can try you. Okay. What do you write? So do you have your, do you have your cheat sheet? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so fill in the blanks. I write blank for blank who read blank. Uh, I write nonfiction for people who read books about self-improvement and motivation, improving themselves. Awesome. Okay, cool. Does that make sense? Anybody else want to give me a fiction writer? Somebody tell me what kind of fiction, because you all have like genres and stuff. <laughs> okay, yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, I, I write um, science fiction for a young adult who needs to be encouraged to be creative and to That's what my goal is. Wow. And what's your name? Melinda. Where are you from? Um, Austin, Texas. So I love the southern accent. I got here as quick as I could, but I don't have a I don't have an authentic southern accent, but I can make it. All right, so then once you figured that out, so you filled in those blanks and you're feeling a little sassy pants, right? And then you add, I make an abundant living. Now I have a formula in prosperity for writers, but I'll give it to you now if you have a little room in the margins. Would you like it? What an abundant living is? It's all of your expenses, everything you need to get from the beginning of the month to the end of the month. And like that includes like a trip to the to the Alamo Draft House for a movie and some snacks, right? This isn't like 
we're getting from the beginning of the month to the end of the month by the hair on our chinny chin chin okay so we have like a fun month with fun things involved you waved at me um and then you multiply that number times 1.5 how would how good would you feel if you made 150 percent of what you needed to live from your writing feel great yeah. Anybody? If you would feel great about it, could you just tell your face right now? <laughs> okay, awesome. So then that becomes your mantra. That becomes the thing. They just are not on with the fact that we're in a little program here, y'all. I'm just saying. Okay, so it becomes your mantra, and your mantra is the thing that you say to yourself twice a day. So anybody have three by five cards? They sell three by five cards, Zach? Mm -hmm. Zach, do you sell three by five cards here? Like index cards? Yeah. We have no cards for sale. Excellent. See, it's all right here at the half price books, everyone. So go get yourself some note cards, a three by five card, a sticky. It's the first thing you read when you wake up in the morning is I make an abundant living writing blank for blank who read blank. Now it's free and it's fast. So who can come up with a real excuse as to why you wouldn't do it? Anybody? All right. <laughs> All right. Does that make sense to you? What you say when you, when you talk to yourself is really important? And so, yes. Push pins. You also need push pins? Yeah, you need push pins for those cards. It doesn't work very well, but push well, so let me give you a couple of hacks. Who has one of these? <laughs> Raise your hand if you have one of these. Okay, cool. So, and what time is your alarm set for in the morning? You don't have to tell me. Whatever time your alarm is set for, change the text of what the alarm is called. I am abundant writer who writes blank for blank who read blank, right? It's the very first thing that you see. Isn't that magical? They also have like paint markers you can write on your bathroom mirror. Or you can just use a, a good old fashioned 1975 three by five index card. Whatever works best for you, whatever you're gonna read twice a day. And then I'm gonna get crazy and I'm gonna say that your words are substance and they go out into the universe. And you best be careful what you say. You ever heard, be careful what you wish for, it might come to you? Well, that works when you're saying I'm an abundant writer who writes nonfiction for people who want to improve themselves. And it also works when you say, I can't make money from my writing. Making money is hard. I have to keep my day job because I have to be practical. I can't tell my parents I'm making money from my writing. They might be disappointed. <coughs> Who's the guy who wrote The Martian? Andy Weir? Andy Weir. I'm pretty sure his parents aren't disappointed in him. <laughs> I'm going to go way out on the skinny branches and say that his parents are probably really proud. Okay, so develop your money consciousness. This is a really big topic that I'm going to try to squish into a couple of minutes. Some people like being poor. They like complaining about money. They're not comfortable earning money from their writing. They're not comfortable earning money. And I'm going to tell you that money isn't anything. It's whatever you give meaning to it. It's just energy. So you have to develop your money consciousness and you've got to get okay with people giving you money for your writing. Because until you can get okay with it, or even like I expect it and I want it, it's not coming. And as long as you like complaining and you're complaining and strategizing about how awful it is and how hard it is and you're talking all that stuff out loud, the AM and the PM affirmation is not going to work for you. So this is the bad news portion of the program. <laughs> or you, did you want to? There was something there. I just grabbed it. Oh, okay. Just she just went like this and I was like, what is it? She's got something magical to say. So is that resonating with anyone? Does anyone want to say anything about that? Do you want to chime in and say, yes, that makes sense. Or I'm having a hard time with that because I can talk you through it. Makes sense. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so you're good. Can you like maybe give up like right this minute? Any issues that you have around receiving money? Yeah. Tell your face. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. All right. So I have a philosophy and part of my philosophy is if you want something, give it away. 
this is a really hard thing for some people, especially if they're getting from the first of the month to the last of the month by the hair on their chinny chin chin. They're thinking, but I don't have any money to give away. But what goes out comes back multiplied. You all believe that? Mm -hmm. What you give out comes back to you multiplied. <clears throat> so if you want money, give it away. And it doesn't have to be a lot. It could be $5. But the next time someone says, do you have money? Give them some money. Just give it away. Send it out and let it come back to you. And so I wrote about, in Prosperity for Writers, the concept of tithing, except I'm not very churchy, right? Some people are raised in the church and they love that. And some people are raised in the church and they don't love that. And so if you talk about tithing, then some people go, ah, it's the church. Some people really love it. So I decided to write about it from the non church perspective because I think it's just a principle. I think what you put out comes back to you multiplied, not in a way that has anything necessarily to do with religion, but more with spirituality. Yes? Well, you know, this is why I go to so many plays, because the people in the acting community have been really good to me. So I go out there and say, okay, I'll go to your play and support you, and I'll yes. do that as much as I can, as well as your movies. Now, that's not giving money away, but it's certainly... <coughs> Spending money and supporting what they do. Yes. Uh, and I see that as well. I can't give back what I can't really give back what you've given me. So you can't so give. I'm sorry. I can't give back what the acting community is giving me because they've given me so much. So I love that. Yeah. Well, I think what you really do give comes back to you multiply, and you can't give. Out, you can't outgive. Like the more I give, the more I receive. And certainly when I know people, when I know people are looking for jobs, I mean, I don't necessarily give them money, but I always say, well, let me look at your resume and I'm like, okay, yeah, I do this, this, this. Okay, I know these people over here. I'll talk to them, you know, or try to give them leads, you know, if they're specific about what they want. I mean, people would just say, oh, I'm looking for a job. It's like, okay, tell me what you got. You know? Yeah, yeah, I like it. Yeah. So my, my action step for you around this is take a percentage of your income of the next amount of money that comes to you and any percentage will work. I like 10, you might start with one, you might start with a half, it doesn't really matter. It's kind of just starting the flow and then pick an organization and give it away. Or go buy somebody a cup of coffee that doesn't know you. It's the end, and it right. Go give five bucks to the person at Starbucks, and then go sit down and say, "I'm buying a cup of coffee for the next person," and just like watch what happens. Like start the magic. Does that make sense? Put it out and let it come back to you. Okay. So we've gone to the end of the woo-woo stuff. How y'all doing? <laughs> Good so far. Good. Okay. So any questions? No. Okay, excellent. So let's get into the practical stuff for the data people. Any data people? Any like analysts in the group? Yes, you're like, okay, okay let's, let's get down to it. All right, so the first one is find your groove. For a really long time, I was doing a practice called the Miracle Morning, first thing in the mornings. Anybody know the Miracle Morning? Okay, so you know it's you get up and you do these practices called the lifesavers and it's meditation and affirmations and reading and scribing and exercising and it takes an hour or more. And then I have this wonderful person who's my daughter, Lexi. And so I got to make her breakfast in the morning because she wants to eat every day. And then she goes off to school. And so my ritual time was in to try to write between eight and 10. And so how many of you have ever intended to do something and it didn't quite happen because then the other stuff happened, right? Then the people start, people call, they call eight o'clock. Eight o'clock in the morning is an appropriate time to call somebody. <laughs> Right? So the people start calling and the emails start coming in. I'm like, Ugh. so then I decided I'm going to move to a time when the, nobody's, nobody's harassing me. 6 a.m. Nobody's harassing me at 6 a.m. I know I go to bed at 7.30, but, <laughs> but I get up and I write from 6 to 7. So if I get up way before that, I can do my miracle morning practices. And if I get up at 5.47, I have 13 minutes to get the butt in the chair to do the writing. And so I have an alarm that goes off at 6. That's my signal to write. How many of you can guess what happens when I don't feel like writing at 6 o'clock? The alarm still goes off. Too bad, so sad. Still writing. And then at 6.58, two minutes before Miss Lexi's alarm goes off, it goes off. I tally how many words I've written. I put it in my little spreadsheet and then I'm done and then if the whole rest of the day I don't write any words I'm averaging on the low end I think the very like worst day I've had is 300 and something words 
and my best day was almost 5,000 because I was using Dragon Dictate. <laughs> so I was getting like speeds of up to 700 words a minute. <laughs> Not really, <laughs> but I was talking really fast and so the words were flowing. And so then what that practice has allowed me to do is it's a six day a week practice and if I happen to get it in on a Sunday morning, great. But if I want to sleep in or I have someone in from out of town, that seventh day is to rest. That's what I heard. <laughs> heard that and so I kind of go with that and so I average six days a week and my average is a little over a thousand words so who can do the math on six days a week for an entire year times a thousand words it's a lot of words right so someone was saying to me that they feel this pressure as um, young authors to produce and to produce and to produce and how will you do that it's you find your groove you find the time of day that works for you um, and identify the best time of day to write and then make that appointment with yourself and it doesn't really matter if you feel like doing it or not because some days I am so in the flow and I love it and the more days I keep the train going right if I keep the the X's on the calendar like Jerry Seinfeld said the easier the, the, the words come but then I have things like business trips I have to go and talk to other people in other cities and then there's travel and then I have to eat at the airport and the food sucks and I'm in a hotel and I can't sleep and ugh, and I'm an introvert so like being around lots of people it's like energy sucking right how many of you right like everyone kind of resonates a little bit with that so I get off track so when I break that chain I'm not as effective and you have to give yourself some grace for that but there's a difference between giving yourself grace and giving yourself six months off. <laughs> so identify your best time of day to write. So then the other part of it is that work smart, the working hard and the working smart piece, is you have to do another thing when you write books or you write articles or you write plays, and that is what? What's the thing you have to do after you've written them and gotten them ready for people to read them? We're an example of one of those things right now at the store. Can I sell them? Yes, yes, and in order for people to know about your books, you have to tell them and that is also called a big ugly word okay. marketing oh god and how many of you just were like I'm gonna to start to write books so I can market I'm so excited to market nobody nobody's hand went up yes okay but you still have to market and marketing is a whole other topic in and of itself because there's the list you have to build and the fans you have to grow, and the social media stuff and all of that stuff. And that also takes time. But I like to do the hard stuff, the harder stuff, the writing stuff when I'm the freshest. So that is from the six to 6.58 in the morning. And then the marketing comes later. And I also have a day job, not really a job. I don't go to a job, but I have a completely separate mixed bag of things that I do for money. And so all those things take time and those people expect me to show up and do my work for them. And so then I have to fit in the marketing. So let me give you like some practical business coachy kind of things that might be helpful. So on a Friday, how many of you all have Fridays every week? Okay, some of you are still with me. All right, good, awesome. So on Friday afternoon, before you're done working, before you do whatever you might do around the four or five o'clock hour, pull out your calendar and look at it and put in the times that you're going to write and put in the times you're going to market the next Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday and just ink that on your calendar. So it could be a recurring appointment if you're able to write at the same time every day. If you have jabberwonky days like I do, like my writing is at the same time because for some reason no one wants to talk to me at 6 a.m. and my phone isn't ringing, but it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 1.30 or 4 o'clock. Those are times that I can fit in the marketing. Does that make sense? But if you don't put it on your calendar and make it a non-negotiable appointment, then what is likely to happen to your marketing time? Yes, thumbs down. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's not gonna happen. So it's gotta go on your calendar. Your writing time and your marketing time have to go on your calendar in advance. And that sounds very practical, professional, not very artsy, right? But that's the business side. Yes, sir. Okay, so let's get even less artsy here. Okay. Some people, mm -hmm. who let's say didn't have this inner artist driving to get out, would think of it in the other order. And they would think about the marketing first. Okay. Before writing the product. Yeah, you don't have anything to sell though. 
<laughs> to figure out whether the thing they want to write, or you know, let's say there are several options that you might write. I can yes. write this, I can write that, I can mm -hmm. write that. The question is which one is most marketable. Figure that out in advance. Do you know anybody who works that way? Yeah, I, I work that way a little bit. It took me a while to get there because I would write, I would just write the thing and then I recognize, so I'll give you like a real world example. I wrote the successful single mom and then that became a series. And then someone said, where's the successful single dad book? And I was like, not a dad, wrong jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone offered to buy a few thousand copies of the successful single dad. And my answer was coming right up. <laughs> I will make that happen. And then I recognize that not everyone who was divorced, which was my situation was a parent. And so I wrote, if divorce is a game, these are the rules, and then the divorced Phoenix. Because I started writing for Huffington Post Divorce, because even though there's Huffington Post single parents, mm -hmm. there's Huffington Post Divorce, which is a big category. So that was an intentional focus. But I'm not unlike... I'm not unlike Chris Fox, who wrote Right to Market and Launch to Market. Those are relatively new books that he's written and I've read right to market and a little bit of launch to market. Um, I think there needs to be a little bit of strategy in your writing, but there also needs to be a whole lot of heart in your writing because if you're just writing to market and you're not writing something that fills you up and makes you happy, then that can be problematic, right? So if you want to write a whole bunch of things and people will ask me all the time, like, why do you write in all these different things? I'm like, cause I wanna and I can, so I do. Right? So if you're looking, if I was coaching someone who wasn't making any money from their writing, I would kind of back them into like, what's the fastest and easiest path to making money from their writing. But then once you're doing it, you have a little more, um, a little more lane to kind of go where you want to go. So it's about being practical and fulfilling your artistic tendencies at the same time. But I decided I wanted the whole pie. I wanted the people who were divorced with and without children, and then I had books for that whole pie. So I'm gonna write if dating is a game, these are the rules, and then I'm gonna write if marriage is a game, these are the rules. I'm gonna get you from the time you're 15 until the time you're 90. Like somewhere in the relationship spectrum, I have, a, I will have a book, right? And, that, and that's very intentional, but I've also had other things that have come up, and I've had those books on my list of books to write for quite some time, but they're not pulling at me as much as some of the other ones that I have. Is that helpful? Pulling at you emotionally. Yeah, exactly. Well, because I wrote The Divorce Phoenix because Amy, who works for uh, Sean, Johnny, and Dave, had gone through a divorce and she said, now I'm the divorced Phoenix. I've come through the divorce and now I'm reinventing myself. And some of you can, you know, half of us have been through a divorce, right? And so <laughs> you kind of know, like you go through your divorce and there's that sucky time, that two years, and then you have this clean slate with which to reinvent the whole rest of your life. and most people aren't told like, hey, like once you get through the sucky time, it's gonna be this, there's this amazing stuff that can happen for you and you can recreate your whole entire life. And so she said, you have to write that book. And I, I, that really just, I kind of stopped everything I was doing and put it right in the middle. And it just flowed out of me much easier than the book that I had been in the middle of writing. Is that helpful? Yeah, so it's good and, and, and my best advice is non-specific. It's like whatever works best for you. Because whatever you're compelled to write is the thing that's gonna be easiest to write. It's sometimes I have that book in my brain and it's like, oh, it's six o'clock. A lot of times, <laughs> six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Eight cups of coffee today instead of four. Okay, so identify your best time of day to write and identify your best time of day to market and ink those, put those on your calendar and let them be non-negotiable appointments that you have with yourself, just like you wouldn't stand someone else up, like love and honor yourself enough to stand up. Okay, so then stop talking and start doing. So I hear a whole lot of I'm gonna, I'm in the process of, I've been doing it for a while. The talking you're gonna be doing is I write blank for people who read blank so I can make an abundant living and then sit down and write the words. So I want you to identify your goal, one goal. What's the one goal if you could reach it by the end of this year? And we have six months and 15 days left. So what's the one goal if on December 31, 2016, you've hit that goal, it would make all the other little things that you want possible. So like if, you, if it's amount of, an amount of money 
or a number of books or an amount of money per year or per month or per week or per day, right? Because you want to reduce it to the ridiculous so it makes more sense. Like making a million dollars sounds like a lot, but if you, it's how much money do you have to make in five minutes? <laughs> so it adds up, <laughs> right? If you reduce it to the ridiculous, like, oh, I can make five dollars. Making a million might be too much, but I can make five dollars. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So figure out what that one goal is, and that's your one purpose. And then write that on your on your three by five card. So underneath your affirmation, I make an abundant living, writing blank for blank, who write blank. Just write your goal. So it's a dollar amount, it's a word count per day, it's the one, it's just one. Don't set 77 goals unless you are really amazing at reaching 76 goals. Because people try to go from I'm broke, I'm single, and I haven't written any words to I'm a millionaire, I'm married, and I'm a bestseller. Right? It's like tomorrow I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna be amazing. Well, it doesn't work like that. You gotta start with the threes <coughs> so you can get to the twenties. Does that make sense? Am I like Oh yeah. Okay, awesome. All right. So then use gamification to reach your goals. So does anybody know who David King is, the trainer that lives in Austin? We were introduced because I do 100 days for my coaching clients and he does 100 days for his training clients. I think he's the uh, Satan's nephew. <laughs> <laughs> because he's like really 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 strict but when he gets on one of his fitness tears like he went to Disney this morning so he's been like the hundred days before he went to Disney it was a hundred days before he went to Disney and the 99 and the 98 so he started with like his pictures and then he's doing his workout and he's posting and he's using gamification and so a lot of times people just say I'm gonna write 500 words a day every day from now until the end of time <laughs> But then Netflix releases the new House of Cards season. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll write my 500 words tomorrow. So somehow, some way, give yourself a challenge. Find a buddy. Take your goal and make it public with one other person. Create a little private Facebook group. And use gamification to work in your favor. It's why we like the shows like The Voice, right? Because they there's gamification, right? It's how many people can call in and vote for you. And we like shows like The Biggest Loser or Strong because there's gamification. We're pitting this team against that team or, you know, these people against those people. And so we're watching this. So use it for yourself because if you just say, I'm going to do something and I'm going to be perfect at it for the whole rest of my life, you don't have any, um, um, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for, John? Urgency, you don't have any reason not to do it. So what's interesting is years ago I had a client and she wanted to lose 35 pounds before she went to her high school reunion. And she said, but I have to do it. I want to look good for my high school reunion. And I don't know how to make sure because, you know, like, I'm fine. Like, I can say I'm not going to do it. But then 8 o'clock at night, there's these little chocolate squares in the freezer. And then, you know, like, I don't live far from an ice cream shop. And I really like bread when I go to lunch with a client. So I went out and got her a can of Fancy Feast uh, cat food. <laughs> a little seafood. Has anybody ever smelled cat food? <laughs> Every day. <laughs> it's kind of not like a nice candle. There's no cat food candle for a reason. <laughs> because no one wants this odor everywhere. Okay, I'm a cat mom, so I get it. So I gave her the little can of Fancy Feast cat food, and I said, it's very simple. You have plenty of time. You know what to do. It's not hard. It's like walk 10,000 steps a day, go to the gym a few times a week, and, and st stay away from the carbs. It isn't hard, right? And I said, so here's what we're going to do like you go to the, fan, the high school reunion and you've lost your weight, cat food is gone. I said, I might even eat it. That'll make you happy. I said, but if you don't, not only are you gonna be fat going to the high school reunion, you have to eat the cat food. So every single meal she would set it out and it was a great conversation piece. And so she had all these people, how many months, how much weight have you lost? Nobody ate the cat food, everybody. It was a really strong aversion and a really strong goal too. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Most people need a moving forward and a moving away. So give yourself gamification in order to engineer yourself for success, right? And don't keep the chocolate squares in the freezer. <laughs> um, the third one is give yourself a no excuses word count. I don't know what it is. Is it, I'm sorry? Would you repeat that? Give yourself a no excuses word count. Because here's the, here's the thing, even if you write a hundred words a day, 
what is that? 30, 36,500 words in a year, right? That's a book, people. How many of you are still trying to write your first book? Okay, so like by next year at this time, if you just write 100 words, how many of you send an email every day? It's 100 words in that email, I promise you. And the more you do it, the more you'll do it, right? The more you make, the more you make, right? Whatever that is, the more you make words, the more you make calls, the more you make outreach. So give yourself a no excuses word count. And I don't care if you're like under the warm electric blanket and you've taken your Z-Equal and you're just closing your eyes and then you open them and you go, oh crap, I didn't write my hundred words. You better get out of bed, go crack open the computer and write it because in a year's time, you'll have whatever the multiple is. Does that make sense? And it's not that hard, right? Yes, sir. So Matt and I were just talking about this before. So there's a little bit of a contradiction between this common advice to write a certain number of words every day. It totally makes sense. And then the other common advice is writing is rewriting. You can expect to. So, so what if it's a day where what you're doing is actually going through and just tightening things up? That was my 300 word day was I had been away from my writing for a little while and then I started to reread a section and I was editing. Yeah. And I'm not confusing the time that I'm writing. So my writing is always the new content piece. Oh, okay. I also then will have the, my editor sends back my finished work and I've checked my ego at the door. <laughs> and I'm really happy when there's one paragraph that doesn't have a correction. <laughs> I totally am, because she's really good, but it's like, oh, there's a lot of marks on there. Right, but that's a different, that's a different thing. So it's like the writing and then the marketing and then there's there's the, the work, right? The work of being a prosperous full-time writer is not, I wish I could just do that from six to seven every day and then be on the beach. That would be amazing, but I haven't cracked that. I'll work on it and then I'll come back next year. <laughs> All right, finally, develop your tribe and connect with connectors. So I described a little bit how I would listen to and stalk the self-publishing podcast guys and then I decided I wanted to know them. But like people think you're really weird and they're a little scared of you if you call them up and you're like, I'm amazing, we should be friends. <laughs> they're like, awesome, check please. <laughs> right? So when you can, put yourself in the room with people that you know would think you're cool and connect with them. And I have a story to go with it. So I have how to connect with anyone, what works and what doesn't. So I'll start with the what doesn't. I um, have people who ask me to write forwards for their books or to read my, their book and give my opinion. And I'm already using all 24 hours in every day. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah. And so I would rather write an endorsement or offer a piece of advice than take four or five hours to read a book, especially one that hasn't been gone through, edited, right? It just takes a lot of time and your time is your most precious commodity. You can always get more money, but you cannot get more time once you spend it, it's gone. Matt, what's my runway? How much time do I have left? I have plenty of time. Yeah, I have plenty of time. Okay, good. All right. So what works is adding value. So I really like it when someone says, I'm gonna get on your reader list and I'm gonna be an advanced reader for you and I'm gonna write reviews. And I recognize what a big deal that is because they're offering to give me their time <coughs> to read my stuff when there are <clears throat> all of the books. They could literally be reading anything. Like I'm really connected to how amazing that is. So if then when someone comes back to me and says, I've done all of this stuff for you, whatever the stuff is, I'm so much more inclined, right? Which is why I was able to connect with not only Sean, Johnny, and Dave, but some of the other people in the summit. Because my thing was, I can't call you up and tell you I'm awesome, but I can read your blogs, and I can read your books, and I can like your Facebook posts, and I can share them, and I can retweet your tweets, and I can go on Instagram and give you a heart and some love, and you're gonna know my name eventually, and then we're gonna be besties, we're gonna connect, and then we're gonna connect in real life, because that's like the real thing, right? And then I can ask, I can make an ask. So if you want to create a platform, you can either create a platform, but how many of you have noticed that all of the cool kids, and I use that term very loosely and not in any kind of weird way, right? Have you ever noticed that they all know each other? Like, did you know that Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito were like roommates at one time or something? Like they know each other before they were twins <laughs> before they were twins they were roommates 
But if you connect with other connectors, then they do you a solid and you do them a solid. So about, oh gosh, I think it was two years ago, I get a call from one of my dear friends here in Austin and he says, there's this guy who was on the James Altucher podcast, who he was a big fan of James Altucher. And he says, there's this guy on the James Altucher podcast and he makes like 40 or 50 grand a month writing eBooks on Kindle. Who am I talking about? Steve Scott. Oh my God, right? If he walked in, we'd all be like, ah, like, you know, like if we were music fans and our favorite rock band walked in, we'd feel a little whatever, right? So I listened to the podcast and I was like, well, James Ultra is really cool and Steve Scott sounds really cool. And so I start following their stuff and reading their blogs and posting on their posts and doing the stuff. And lo and behold, I end up in a room with Steve Scott. So some of you know what the Miracle Morning is, and some of you know that I'm Hal Elrod's business partner in the Miracle Morning book series. And what that means is I heard the cats. So I worked the co-authors to produce the books, write some of them, help write some of them, but just basically produce the books and launch them as bestsellers. So Hal calls me and he says, hey, we should do the Miracle Morning for writers. How about we ask Steve Scott? And I was like, that would be amazing. I would love to work with Steve Scott. So we get Steve Scott on board and he writes the book and it's coming out in a few weeks. And then we were like, hey, what if James Altucher would write the foreword? And so we write to James Altucher and ask him to write the foreword, and he does. And that was me, you guys. That was me like two years ago. I'm like, nobody knows me. I'm just writing my books and publishing my books and getting on Facebook and pressing like and pressing retweet and connecting and then adding value. Cause I know I can't call you up and go, hey, I'm fabulous, but I can add value to you. And I actually have a skill set that some people want access to. And so I give it, here you go. Here's how you can do this, this, and this. Kind of like here. Cause I was totally fired up to come and add value. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So what works is adding value, doing all the stuff, anything you can think of, write a thank you note. I got an invitation to a wedding from someone who read one of my books. And she said, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be getting married. So she invited me to her wedding. And it's like a theme wedding, so I even need a costume. <laughs> so I haven't decided, but if in August you see me post something on Facebook, please like and retweet it. Because <laughs> I went all the way for it. So your call to action is to fill in your blanks, get your three by five card, use your phone to give set alarms, to remind you throughout the day, say your affirmation out loud, write the words. And then I think there's one more thing that it's occurring me to say that isn't in my notes. I hear this a lot and I never had this really because I kind of thought that I wasn't a writer, like I didn't have a writing degree. So I for a long time called myself a lowercase w writer, not a, I wasn't a, I didn't go to school for writing. So I was like, oh, I'm just a writer. And I remember someone saying, you've written seven books, you could lead with that. like. That's a thing, right? But I never thought anybody was gonna read my words, so I didn't have a fear of getting them out into the world because I thought, well, eight people are gonna read them and they're not gonna care anyway, right? So if you have any hesitancy about whether your words are good enough, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Write your words, go through the process and then release your words to the world and then just keep writing. And then, you know, 15 years from now, you'll read that work that you did back then and you'll kind of shake your head and <laughs> go wow i've learned a lot and then you can speak words into other people who have those hesitancies to release their words is that helpful to anybody i kind of felt like that needed to be said so questions that um during the first five years when you were writing and um amazon had the wrong account number and you thought they were paying you because they weren't selling any books um what was your self-talk like? How did you stay positive during the first five years? I'm an inherently positive person. So there were two five-year periods of time. There was the period of 2004 to 2010 when I wasn't a writer. I was just writing books, but I was an executive coach and a speaker. So I made my money doing corporate training and coaching. So I wasn't thinking that this thing was gonna make me any money. I was just told to write a book because everyone's a coach and a speaker. So you have to have a book. That's what, you know, like, so what? You're a coach and a speaker. That's everybody. So you have to write a book. How hard can that be? Ha ha. So I did that. And then I had the idea to write The Successful Single Mom. And I did. And I published that book. But I didn't have any, like, 
what's going on. So it wasn't until after my third book that I figured out that Amazon had the wrong account. So it was all that, you know, nine grand or whatever, but over those years. And then I turned 40 in 2010 and decided that I was going to, by the time I was 45, right? So now you all know exactly how old I am. <laughs> um, to make a full-time stream of income from that and then I was going to quit coaching. So I actually got there by age 43. So I was making my 150% from my writing in 2013. But then I have clients and they won't let me stop working. So <laughs> I just keep working and I like them and so it's all good, right? Make hair while the sun is shining. So I'm still doing some coaching and training and that sort of thing. But my self-talk never, I never let my self-talk get in the way. And so when I hear people with bad self-talk, I'm like, just tell that, tell that guy to shut up. Like you, were, you just you kept busy, and you kept working, and you didn't let yourself think of, like, dwell on it. Yes, yeah. yes. And I, I, I didn't know anything about a Kindle Gold Rush because I didn't, right. I didn't know I wasn't connected to all of. I was like, damn, I could. Yeah, you totally, were working. I was totally head down, yeah. working, raising a kid, all that. Hi. One of the tough things, especially when you're over forty, is. What do you do for health insurance? Oh, so I have a guy. I have a guy who, who I pay. What's that? So I have a guy that I pay. It's outside of the awesome. They're not going to do that, but I don't. I have a guy, and it's not very expensive for me and my husband and my daughter. So. Okay, you have a husband, so you, you don't have, really know. Oh, I do. I, I'm the, he is an entrepreneur also. So we get our own health, health insurance. I don't mean I have a guy like my husband. Yeah. I have a guy who I get health insurance from. Yeah. <laughs> I have two guys, this guy and the health insurance guy. <laughs> One of them is expendable. And, well, <laughs> I make a full-time income from my writing. Okay. Like yeah. everyone's expendable. Even you, no, I'm kidding. <laughs>